Our sermon text this evening is taken from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 59, verses 12 through 20. For our offenses are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us, and we acknowledge our iniquities, rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, fomenting oppression and revolt, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. So justice is driven back, and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets, honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found, and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm worked salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. According to what they have done, so will he repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. From the west, men will fear the name of the Lord, and from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory. For he will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. The Redeemer will come to Zion. To those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. So far, time. Dear Christian friends, this evening we start a new season of the church here. The season of Lent has been called a wandering in the wilderness for God's people. We say this because Jesus was in the wilderness, tempted for 40 days. That's the gospel lesson appointed for the first Sunday in Lent. The season of Lent is 40 days. Well, we aren't wandering aimlessly like the Old Testament Christians. We are on a journey, a march toward the cross. that's culminated on Good Friday when we remember Jesus' suffering and death for our sins. For most of the history of the early church, people were illiterate. On through the Middle Ages, most people could not read. And so these truths of Scripture were communicated, not necessarily in print. They were spoken. And they were told through architecture, through stained glass. They were told in beautiful ways. The cross that you have behind you tells a little bit of the church here as well. Advent, in the top, Lent underneath it, and you jump up to Easter with the butterfly, and then you're back down at Christmas again. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the very top is Pentecost, the Palms, the Palm Sunday are at the bottom. Sometimes the whole story, sometimes the stations of the cross in Catholic churches that you'll see is beautiful. There is no limit, really, to what people can do when it comes to symbolism to bring God's story God's plan of salvation to life. Those are all good. And one of those things could be ashes. Of course, there's nothing wrong with ashes. Obviously, it's optional. We don't have to do that. I don't have an imposition of ashes at Star of Bethlehem where you come forward and I put them on your head whether you like it or not. It's if you want to. It can be a symbol of your repentance. Because as you stand before the fire of God's law, there's nothing left except ashes. That's what we are before our God. We can't hold a candle. We can't say a thing and contend, to contend with his law. Well, this morning, this evening, I want to go forward and say no one can turn away God's wrath. There was no one until the Lord's arm worked salvation. Let's look at verse 12 once more. You can see it in your worship folder. Um, This is just describing these sins. He's about to go through a long list of them in detail. But first, for our our offenses are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us, and we acknowledge our iniquity. Just like the Eskimos had a, well, they say a hundred words for snow. I don't think it's quite that many. There's the snow that falls from the sky, the snow that's squishy, the fluffy snow. Um, there's the snow that just blows from the ground across. You can have a blizzard without any snowfall per se, because you can't see. 
There's all kinds of snow, so also the Hebrew language has a lot of words for sin. And here we talk about how, first, there are many sins. We cannot count them. We sin and we don't even realize it. King David says, remember all my hidden thoughts. He can't even count them all. And, well, they're obvious and undeniable. Even if we can't see them, when we come before our God, he sees them all. It does no good to hide them. And finally, they don't go away. I know that some people have confused short-term memory for a clean conscience. But it doesn't work. Satan, the accuser, likes to bring up old sins just as well as new ones. He doesn't care. He can plague your conscience either way. So it's better to just get them out there. You just let God deal with them. And to stand before God's law, no matter how uncomfortable it is. Listen to verse 13. Rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, fomenting oppression and revolt, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. There's a lot in here. First of all, rebellion. That's really a pretty easy one. You don't have to take up arms against the government to have rebellion. All you have to do is know what you're supposed to be doing and then not do it. You see that in small children and big kids, too. All of us know what it's like to know better, but not do it anyway. That's rebellion against your God. Now, how about treachery? What does that look like? I got a secret. God will never find out. That's a lie that Satan whispers in your ear. Of course he'll find out. He knows all things, and yet that's the treachery that sometimes we bring against our God as if no one else can see, well, then maybe our God can't either. It's ridiculous, and yet is that how we think? Turning our backs on God? Well, yeah, we do that, and I think it gets deeper than that. Uttering lies our hearts have conceived, we get to the very heart and detail of sin. What exactly does that mean? Sin isn't just the little things that we fail to do perfectly. It's all the things that we don't do. If you hear your neighbor drowning in the swimming pool, but don't do anything, that's a sin, to let them drown. God expects perfection. The word for sin means missing the mark. That is to say that you need to get a double bullseye every time or else it's sin. There's no good enough for God. It has to be perfect in every way. And if you've ever met someone who thinks that they're good enough for God, or if they answer the question, why would God let you into heaven? And they say, well, I've been pretty good. Well, that's not good enough. God demands perfection completely. And it's not really something that we like to think about because none of us can reach that. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with verse 14. So justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth is stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. What does that sound like to you? To me, that sounds like, like the nightly news. It just, it's horrible. You see police tape, and you see somebody died. Uh, there was a horrible story in Winston-Salem, I don't know if you saw this, where an, I think an 82-year-old man was beaten to death in his home. My word. And they caught the two teens who did it. That's despicable. That's not the first time that that's happened either in Winston-Salem. I think that story is repeated around the world, sadly, not just here, of course. And yet that's awful to think that. And I think we like to watch the news and point and say, well, that's not me. And yet you have to wonder, have I ever drawn someone away from their God? Have I ever, well, maybe brought them down? Have my sins ever done this? Or, on the other hand, if you are trying to stop people from doing something wrong, whether you're in a school or on the job, you're basically painting that target on your own back, aren't you? It's not easy to follow God's will for your life. The world will not support you. And this is what our God sees when he looks. What is his reaction? The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled. 
there was no one to intervene. There's no one to turn away God's wrath. We lump ourselves in with that crowd. And yet God's law leaves us in a very helpless, pathetic state. It leaves us in ashes. And when we reach that point, we are at the perfect spot to hear how He saves us. When we've despaired of ourselves, we trust only in Him. That's exactly where our God wants us. And that's the perfect place for the Christian to be. Lifted up by our God. Hear how the Lord's arm works salvation. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm worked salvation for him. And his own righteousness sustained him. The picture is, oh, a blind person. You have to kind of go with me that that person's blind, but they couldn't have made it across the street without that person helping them. And yet that doesn't even quite get the point. If you're blind, you just need a little bit of help. But in our case, we needed a whole lot more than a new deal, my fellow disciples of Christ. We don't need more rules. We don't need a 30-year mortgage to pay off our sin. More time wouldn't do it. That isn't good enough. We are beyond help. God has to intervene completely. So His own arm worked salvation for Him in his own righteous righteousness sustained him. This is Jesus. Jesus came and lived as our substitute, not our helper. We need so much more than help. We need a replacement, a substitute. Someone who lives in our place, and then, unless you want to die for your own sins, someone to die in your place too. And that's what Jesus was. He died for your sins, and so now all that's left is freedom. You're paid in full. Your debt is gone. And you stand before your God holy and clean. Isaiah talks about it in this way. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. There's four articles of clothing here. The first two are good. The second two not so good. The first two, a breastplate was this heavy thing that protected you. It's righteousness. By faith, this is yours. Things just bounce off of you. Satan can't accuse you of anything because by faith in Jesus, his perfection is yours. That first lesson, God's great exchange, details it. God made him who had no sin. He sin personified for us. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. That one passage can convert so many souls as the Holy Spirit works faith. It describes beautifully what our God has done. As he exchanges our imperfection, our sin, our failure for Jesus' success and victory. Well, I, I don't clearly know of anybody that wears a breastplate. So I usually talk about it like a t-shirt. A great bright white t-shirt that describes the righteousness that's ours. The helmet on his head some people say, well, his mind was wrapped around it completely and he went for salvation. I guess so. It just describes Jesus going to the cross. And yet this is not where the vision ends. You see, when Isaiah sees his arm working salvation and righteousness, God was appalled at all the horror in the streets. Remember? The nightly newscast. Well, you can't just forgive sin. You also punish evil. And for those who refuse that bright white t-shirt, that breastplate, what's left for them? Well, Jesus is wrapped in a cloak and garments. These are garments of vengeance. He wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. I don't know if we use the word zealous a whole lot anymore, but uh, you could say that I'm zealous for fishing and soccer, and yet after, oh, about six weeks of soccer, I'm ready for the season to be over. After a couple days of fishing, my wrist is tired. I'm done. That's oh my God. On the last day, there will be no end for his zeal as he goes after those people who have wronged his Christians. That's the picture of our God. Perfect holiness, perfect redemption, and perfect well, vengeance also on all of his foes. This is important to note too, Christian, because as you walk around with the target on your back, your job may be to suffer for your, for your God, for Jesus. It's not to fight back. God doesn't necessarily want you to not defend yourself. 
and yet you don't have to worry about getting even. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Like God is holy, he does it perfectly. Any time that I've ever tried to take revenge, I just end up making a mess. It doesn't go so well. Leave that business to God. Let's go on to verse 18. According to what they have done, so will he repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. This may be kind of an odd picture, I suppose. The islands were a picture of anybody, just the Gentiles. People who weren't part of Israel. These are the outsiders that did horrible things to their God. And this is what he's going to do to them. But now what's he going to do to you? When I was a young boy, I loved watching the spin cycle. We had a top-down wash machine, not one of those front-loader jobs. That's so cool. And um, you realize that if you open the lid, the spin cycle ends. So you know how you get around that, right? You should have a stick or a toothbrush back there, and then you can leave it open and watch the spin cycle in all of its glory. And do you think that's good enough? Oh, no. You need to reach in so you can feel the wind on your face of the spin cycle. And you put your hand right in the middle where you pour the fabric softener, and you just watch it go, and you could like be in it as it's spinning. The problem is that as you do that, you just fused that thing that pulls out that lint trap, and that thing that catches the uh, fabric softener, and you just basically ruined it. And then when your parents come by and they say, what happened to the washing machine? I don't know, it must have been Phil. <laughs> yeah. And then you look at verse 18. And then God's Spirit cuts you to the heart, and he says, according to what they have done, so will he repent. Wrath to his enemies, retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. That's not me. And that's not you. You're a child of God. So for all the ridiculous things you've done in your past, and for the things that you're going to do in the future, you stand forgiven. And that's where the last two verses are so powerful. From the West, men will fear the name of the Lord. And why? From the rising sun, they will revere his glory. How so? For he will come like a pent up flood at the breath of the Lord drives a lawn. The Redeemer will come to Zion. To those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. Have you ever seen the horror of a tidal wave? It is just creepy. It doesn't necessarily come and knock down buildings. It's like this creeping ooze. The video of it that I've seen in. Malaysia and Indonesia and Japan, just horrifying. And you can't stop it. The power is ridiculous. Picks up cars, anything in its path. So is the forgiveness of our God. Kicking down Satan's door, taking hearts for the kingdom of God, this pent-up flood forgives. And I've seen it happen. It is awesome to see that knock down in our heart. And that starts in the season of Lent. If you know of someone who doesn't know Jesus, this is a great time to start. Just to watch the, the sermons online or to attend worship. Just to see Lent and then to go through it, go to Good Friday and then on Easter. Feel the joy. People cannot understand who just show up on Easter. They don't get it. They don't necessarily, they understand the enthusiasm and the beautiful flowers and the song, but they don't know the 40 days of wandering to that cross, of taking a long, hard, horrid look at your own sin and knowing that your God forgave you and just how far he went. Oh, is the joy of Easter. This is the joy that will be yours at the end of the season of Lent and you have a taste of it right now as you hear these words from Isaiah. Dear friends, there was no one. No one to turn away God's wrath. The Lord's own arm was the salvation. Amen. Please stand.